So today, um, yesterday we covered strong normalization versus the simply typed lambda calculus. And I mentioned yesterday that I was uh, trying to, that, uh, that I was going to try to give you, you know, one presentation uh, of logical relations, the standard one yesterday. And today I'm going to switch to a slightly different way of essentially doing the same sort of proof. Um, but we'll, um, specifically we'll cover type safety today. So I assume that everyone here has proved, uh, has done a proof of type soundness or type safety for the simply typed lambda calculus using progress and preservation? Yes? Yes? You better all have. Better all have. <laughs> More hands? <laughs> oh, okay. Right, of course. <laughs> Sorry, I walked in late. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to do, uh, we're going to prove type safety today using logical relations. <coughs> Turns out you can do that. Um, so what, let's write down a statement of type safety. Someone want to help me out? Type safety, type soundness. By the way, simply type lambda calculus from yesterday is up on the top board um, with the usual call by value, um, small step semantics. Uh, so we want to prove type safety. What is it that we want to, how, how do we state that? We want to show that if a term is well typed, let's say if a closed term E has type tau, then it reduces to a value. Okay, that's actually strong normalization. That's even stronger than what I want. Like because, and I, and I say that because I'm going to add um, recursive types to this language later on in this lecture. And at that point, we won't have termination. Yes? I don't. <laughs> yes, and this is precisely my point. In general, what type safety should mean, or you know, what, what we mean when we say type safety, there's this uh, well-known slogan, um, well-typed programs do not go wrong. Right? Another way of saying that is well-typed programs do not get stuck. We don't want to get stuck. Right, like where you have uh, something like true being applied to a lambda or something like that, or true being quite false. That would be a stuck thing, right? You can't not, uh, that can't produce any proof. And it's not about okay, So in general, and the point I'm trying to make is um, the way that most of you are trained these days, and even I was, um, is, you know, we get of type safety as literally being progress and preservation. It is not. Progress and preservation is one method of proving type safety. It's a very syntactic, operational sort of method of proving uh, what we actually want. And what we actually want is this property. We want to say that if a program is well typed, um, and let's say it takes a number of steps, some number of steps, zero or more, to some E prime, then at that point in time, either, um, either, E prime is a value, or there exists another E double prime such that E prime can step to E double prime. That is what we mean by well-typed programs do not get stuck. Okay, here's a well-typed program. You've been running it for a while, or maybe you haven't even taken any steps yet. This could be zero, right? Um, but at this point in time, at any point in time, either you have already reached a value, or it is possible to take another step. Means you're not stuck. Okay? Yes. No, we don't. See, we're very no. We don't need to. Uh, this is all we need. This is the top level theorem that we're interested in proving when we do type soundness. Um, when we use the method of progress and preservation to prove type soundness, there we have, we always look at only one step <coughs> reduction. Right? So let's uh, let's think about progress and preservation. Right? Let's just write it down. Then says that if E is well typed, then we can always take one step, right? Then there exists an E prime such that. By the way, anytime I start writing too small, just tell me immediately, okay? All right. Um, and preservation says. <coughs> oh, yes, sorry. Um, then either, I'll just write val E to mean this wordy thing about something is a value, okay? All right, so then either E is a value 
Um, or there exists an E prime such that we can step to E prime. Right? And preservation says that if E is well typed and E steps to E prime, then E prime has the same type tau. Right? And the issue, the, uh, the point is that in progress and preservation, since we're always looking at one step, we have to sort of maintain, um, in, well, preservation, basically, right? We have to uh, prove that after every step, the type is preserved. And using these two theorems, we, uh, or lemmas, we prove the theorem that we're actually interested in, which is this one, right? So we say that uh, we want to show that if some E is well typed and E reduces to E, um, E has stepped all the way to E prime. Now we want to show that either E prime is a value or, or uh, there exists an E double prime, right? So what do we do? We first go and use our progress lemma a whole bunch of times, and that tells us, sorry, we first go and use our preservation lemma a whole bunch of times, right? And that tells us that our E prime that we've gotten th to here has the type tau, right? And then we can use progress, and we know that either E prime is a value or there exists another one. Yes? Um, this is a star. Okay, this is a star. Not a star, yeah. Um, so yeah, sorry if it's too small. It's a star, so it's zero on one side. Okay, so I we may make the point that um, we're, we're going to prove type safety directly using logical relations. We will not be using progress and preservation. Alright? And by the way, there's Right now, we're working in a very simple setting. We have, we're just working with a simply typed lambda calculus. But as you develop richer languages with richer type systems, sometimes, um, well, one issue with progress and preservation is that after every single step, you have to be able to type check your program. You have to be able to type check running programs. And sometimes, in order to be able to type check the running programs, you have to build a lot more stuff into your type system. At the end of the day, we only care about type safety. And so, you know, the, the type system that you need in order to type check surface programs, the programs that a programmer can write down in your language, that system could be much simpler, depending on your language, than the type system, the enriched type system that you need in order to type check intermediate terms. And you wouldn't need to type check intermediate terms if you weren't using progress and preservation to do your proof. I just want you to keep that sort of as a mental note in the back of your head, all right, for the future. All right, and we'll see a very, very simple instance of this when we get to um, mutable references in a couple of days. Um, there's a distinction between the type system that you might need to write down to type check uh, surface programs that a programmer can write down and uh, the type system that you need in order to type check running terms or intermediate terms. Okay, yeah. I want the designers of the language to care about uh, what they can say about intermediate programs through execution. So I want them to care about the complex type system that they have, even if it's not shown to be as useful. The designers of the language or the program? The designers of the language. Of the language, yes, absolutely. So uh, what I'm saying about the type system not needing to be so rich in order to type check intermediate terms, it's not that the, the, the you know, uh, that the work required to prove type safety All right, so here's what we, how we're going to approach this. We're using logical relations, again, a unary logical relation to prove this. I'm going to set this up slightly differently. Uh, we're going to define a value interpretation of types. So what we're going to do is for every single type in our, uh, you know, basically by induction over the structure of types, for the types in our language, we are going to, um, going to write down when expressions of, the, uh, sorry, when values of the language belong to that type. Okay? 
So we're sort of building a model of Keister's set. So let's start by doing this for Bool. So what are the values that belong to the type uh. Bool? All right, let's do function. Okay, so what are the values that belong to the function type tau and r tau 2? Lambdas, okay. So since it's tau and r tau 2, I better have lambda x colon tau 1 here, right, to match this tau 1 and some expression. And when does an arbitrary lambda behave like um, a function of type tau 1 or tau 2 specifically? Okay, so a function is something that you apply, right? So we want to capture how we use it. We want to capture its behavior. So we say, okay, if you give me some argument, some value v that behaves like an appropriate argument uh, of type tau 1, then if I take that v and substitute it into the body of the lambda, e, right, basically after beta reduction, um, this expression will behave like an expression of type tau 2. actual, you know, you, you will be applying it to a value form. You will have already reduced your argument to a value. That's why. If, the, if we were doing this for a call by name, uh, uh, you know, version of simply type lambda calculus, I would put for all e in e of tau 1 here. Not just value? Okay, that's a very good point. Okay, so, so this is an expression right now, right? So I clearly can't just put v here. Fair enough. That's, uh, so I'm, I'm separating my definitions out so that I have to think about value forms separately from expression forms. And I think this leads to a nicer, more modular definition. So in particular, right now, I haven't told you what this is. So let's define this next. Was there another question or can we? Okay. All right. Um, okay. So we're going to define the set E tau. All right. The set of expressions of that behave like expressions of type tau. So when does an expression, an arbitrary expression E, right? This is an arbitrary uh, type tau. When does an E behave like something of type tau? When it reduces to a value of type tau. When it reduces to a value of type tau, exactly. So, or when sorry? Or when, it loops. or when it loops, exactly. So I want to capture that looping phenomenon. So let's not insist that it, it value it to a value of type tau. We're going to say that if, um, so for all E prime such that um, E reduces in some number of steps, zero or more, this is a star, uh, to E prime, uh, and that E prime is irreducible, I'll explain this notation in a second, then we want to make sure that the E prime is actually a value of type tau. Okay, so by irreducible here, I mean um, any expression that is either a value or is stuck. So irreducible simply means that there does not, that the, uh, you know, that E prime cannot take another step. So irreducible of any, any expression is irreducible if there does not exist an E prime such that you can step from E to E prime. That's all. Okay, so that means it could be a value or it could be a stuck expression. All right, so what I'm saying is that you can take a whole bunch of steps, but eventually when you get to an irreducible state, you better have a value 
in your hand of the right type that behaves like a value of type tau. Okay? Yes? Can you motivate why stars um, on our, on, both on the step of type safety and both the step of the E? I mean, my, my natural intuition is we work in like the one step world. So why are we in the many step world? Um, we is, is it weaker oh. or stronger? Like um, well, so type safety in general should be, it doesn't matter how many steps you've taken till now, you should now be able to take one more step. That's why I have to start. Okay. And here, I'm basically saying, take however many steps you need to take to get to an irreducible step. Uh, irreducible step. Okay. When you can't take any more. Yeah. Okay. So, any other questions? Yeah. I mean, I'm assuming that so, I mean, we, we have irreducible and value as different pred predicates because we haven't proved that they're the same. Precisely. Okay. Yes. So, so basically, we, we are saying that any expression, we don't know that this expression is going to reduce to a value. Well, it's a simply type lambda calculus, so you could say that it will reduce to a value. Let's try an alternative definition. We could have defined E tau like this. Any expression E behaves like it has type tau um, if there exists a V such that um, E reduces to V in some number of steps and V belongs to V of tau. What is this definition doing? If we go with this definition, then we're saying that um, for an expression to, you know, for us to say that an expression behaves like it has type tau, it must reduce to a value and the value behaves like it has type tau. Exactly. Right. So if, if you swapped in this definition instead of this one, you it would essentially be proving strong normalization which is what we did yesterday, right? I was telling you that we were going to work with an alternative way of writing uh, down the, the, the logical relation that, um, from yesterday in, in some sense. Um, I will add. I just don't want to add it right now. Okay? I will add it in the second half. Okay. Um, so we're not, we're not going to do strong normalization. I just want to show you type safety. Okay, so uh, now we have, uh, so by the way, here I'm assuming that, you know, the values that I'm putting in here, we're uh, building these value interpretations of type uh, out of uh, values that have the, this type. So syntactically, they're closed values. Right? So in a sense, whenever I have V tau and it contains certain values, I want it to be the case because the value has that type tau and it's closed um, whenever I write E tau, I want to put he uh, here, I want to put an expression that is a closed expression uh, that of type tau. Okay? Yes? Can you tell us the definition from you? Recover the strict statement of preservation from this? Yeah. Um, so, could you design a system that uh, sets to some in type values but then <coughs> ends up in a very type value? So, some, somewhere in the beginning of the at an intermediate state. Um, my first point is to say that uh, why do you want preservation? You just want type safety. Um, but I, I'm not sure. Um, because you see here where uh, we go all the way to an irreducible state. We don't even talk about the ones in the middle. Right? So at least with this definition, I don't think so. Okay? Or maybe you can. I just, I've never tried it. Um, I would need to stare at it before I say yes or no. Yep? Yeah? Um, so you know, uh, yeah. um, irreducible, so irreducible right now could, okay, so what does this definition say? say? It says that we get to an irreducible state, which may be a value, or it may be a stuff state. Then we say it must be a value. Right? So, I mean, you could sort of say, why didn't I just write V here? Well, because, 
basically, I'm trying to build a logical relation with which I can prove type safety. Okay? So what I'm trying to prove is that you take a bunch of steps and you get, get somewhere where you can't take any more. And then I will show you that this is, in fact, a value state that you've reached. It's not, a, it's not a, an arbitrary stuck state. Yes? type tau. What does that really tell us? In a semantic or operational sense, what does that tell us about what will happen when we run that expression? That's the question I'm trying to answer. Precisely. Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm trying to say that, so what I'm trying to say here is that a lambda term behaves like it has type tau 1 arrow tau 2 if when I give it a value that behaves like it has type tau 1, I get back an expression after beta reduction that behaves like an expression of type tau 2. Behaves like is kind of key here. By behaves like I mean when you run it, it, it doesn't violate the assumptions that you have in your head about how this thing is supposed to be. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, so this is my way of saying that this is an expression that behaves like it has type tau too. And then we've explained what we mean by that. An expression behaves like it has type tau if when you run it, eventually when it gets to an irreducible state and you can't run anymore, you have in your hands a value that behaves like it has type tau. So it's kind of circular in, in some sense, right? Because um, now we go back to the value definition, but uh, yeah. This is on par with the SN form we used yesterday. It's just defining what we're attempting to prove. We haven't actually got to the mechanism of how we're going to prove that. On par, meaning? Uh, it's analogous. It is analogous. Yes. Yes. These are our logical relations like SN1 are logical. Precisely. These are logical relations like SN1 are logical relations. In particular, Now, so far we've been working with uh, closed values and closed terms. All right, so next uh, let's talk about, just like we did yesterday, we needed to lift the notion of um, strong normalization, right? Uh, we first defined uh, when closed expressions belonged to the relation Fn, and then we talked about lifting that notion to open terms. All right, so we're going to do an analogous thing here. Um, 
basically what I want to do is I want to define a semantic notion. So here, you know, type safety judgment. E has type tau under gamma, right? I want to define an analogous semantic notion, which I'm going to write with a double uh, turn cell here, all right? And I want you to read this as um, E is an open term, okay? Uh, and, and it behaves like, when, when given so, again, going back to the, the slogan from yesterday, right? Logical relations, the slogan is that if you give me terms or inputs that have a certain property, then I will give you back outputs that have that property, all right? Or if you give me related inputs, I will give you related outputs. Okay, so we're going to try to define the semantic notion of, of safety, of type safety. Um, okay, so here's what I want to do. First, let's talk about substitutions. Again, substitutions gamma, just like we had yesterday. Uh, we're going to define um, a set G gamma, okay, uh, of substitutions gamma. This is going to start to look very familiar. Such that, by the way, little gamma, just like yesterday, maps variables to values. Uh, we want the domains of the two gammas to be equal, just like yesterday. Um, and for all x in the domain of gamma, it better be the case that gamma x, the values that these variables map to, belong to the value interpretation, sorry, not of tau, of gamma x. Okay, so I'm trying to say, what are the, all the substitutions that satisfy this type environment? These substitutions map variables to values. The type environment maps variables to types. Okay, so we basically want to make sure that we have mappings for exactly the same variables in the substitution as we do in the environment. And then we want to say that each one of the values that we have in our substitution uh, behaves like a value of the right type, the type that gamma says it should have, that big gamma says it should have, right? Okay, and now using that, we can define our notion of semantic type safety, if you, if you will, which goes like this. Um, Basically, we want to say that for all substitutions gamma that behave appropriately, like, you know, given, val given a substitution that contains values of the right types, um, it should be the case that if we use gamma to close E, then we get an expression that behaves like it has type tau. That make sense? Questions? Yes. Our expression relations for closed expression. Exactly. Okay, we're talking about closed expression. Uh, closed values of closed expression. So this is the expression relation. Closed expressions that are now related to closed expression. Any other questions? Okay. claim that in order to prove type safety, here's the theorem that I actually need to prove. Or it'll follow, but let's just say this way. If E type checks under gamma and has type tau, then E will semantically behave like it has type tau under gamma. That's how you should read that. Okay. Now, before we go any further about and even start to talk about how we prove this theorem, um, why is that the theorem that we want for type safety? Okay. All right. And in particular, we can get one. So. Here's the really 
easy way of saying it. Let's prove this corollary. Um, type safety, as stated over here, is simply a corollary once you have this theorem. So let's try to prove it. Um, so we're going to try to prove this, given this. OK? Everyone with me? Because once we have that, we know that you know, this theorem is good enough to give us type safety. All right. So we are going to prove, I, let me write corollary up there. <laughs> this is the corollary we're going to prove. So let's see if this follows from this theorem. OK? Uh, all right. So we want to show that, um, so here's the proof of my corollary. Um, we say, suppose, um, or we're given that e, e is a closed term of type tau. And we know that E takes a bunch of steps to get to E prime. And now we have to show either show that either E prime is a value, which I'm now writing as val E prime, um, or there exists an E double prime such that E prime steps to E double prime. That's what we have to show. OK? Well, let's see. All right, we know that E has type tau. Therefore, let's go use this theorem. This theorem tells us that uh, from the theorem, we know that under an, a closed gamma, E semantically behaves like it has type tau, right? Since E has type tau, E semantically has type tau. Good? Yes? OK. Um, so now we know that. Uh, let's go look at the definition of, of this of semantic type safety, right? OK, so E doesn't have any open, uh, any um, free variables, right? Gamma is empty. OK, so this definition tells us that f um, you need to pick some substitutions, but we don't need to pick any substitutions because gamma is empty. All right, so this theorem then basically immediately tells us that uh, gamma is empty, so E belongs to E of tau. OK, so now, therefore, from this, we can, just looking at the definition, we know that to E of tau. Yeah? OK. Um, let's go look at the definition of that. What does that tell us? Uh, that tells us that for all E prime such that E gets to E prime, if it's irreducible, et cetera. OK, now let's make an observation before we do anything else. Uh, we know that here we're given that E takes some number of steps to get to E prime. Yes? Either that E prime is irreducible or it's not. Fair enough? OK, so this E prime, it's either irreducible or not. Let's take the case where it's not irreducible. If it's not irreducible, then by definition, it can take another step. Right? So we've just shown this. In the case where it's not irreducible, we can take another step. Good. <coughs> we're done with the not irreducible case. Now let's consider the case where it is irreducible. All right, so now we're considering the case where E prime is irreducible. OK, so now let's go look at this definition, because it tells us something about what happens when E prime is irreducible. So now we know that E belongs to E of tau. And we know that E has steps to some E prime that is irreducible. Therefore, we know that that E prime belongs to V of tau. So therefore, E prime belongs to V of tau. By definition, that means that E prime is a value. And we're done. By the way, could everyone just close their laptop? I forgot to say this yesterday. Um, I think you'll, you'll get a lot more out of it, unless you're using it to take notes or something. Um, hope this doesn't make me unpopular, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's true. Uh, can you prove a complete statement? Uh, complete statement. Um, Uh, 
functions that we have on the board over here, they really have type safety just built in. Right? Okay. Um, all right, so the main task then is how do we prove this theorem? Right? Because we haven't really done anything yet. <laughs> um, I've just shown you that if we could prove that, then we would have type safety. Okay, so let's push this up. And how would we prove that theorem? Induction on the, this typing derivation, right? Okay, so we have a bunch of cases. Again, let's do, I'm just going to bore you guys now, but let's just do it anyway. Um, the case where we have true, just like we did yesterday. Um, okay, so um, now we want to show that true behaves like it has type fool semantically, right? So let's just unwind the definitions. What happens? What do we have to do? We have to show this. Therefore, we say, suppose that we're given a gamma in G of gamma, right? Um, we have to show that gamma applied to E, which in this case is true, be behaves like an expression of type bool, right? Okay. Um, again, gamma applied to true is just true because true is closed, right? So this is equivalent to showing that true behaves like an expression of type bool. All right. So let's go look at what we need to do in order to show that E belongs to E of bool. Um, all right. Looking at the definition, we have to show that for all E prime such that true steps to E prime if it's irreducible, et cetera. All right. So suppose true steps to some E prime that is irreducible, show that E prime is in V of bool. Okay, but now we know that true steps to some E prime, but true is a value already, so E prime must be, must be true itself, right? Therefore, what we all we need to show is E prime is, since E prime is true, um, we just need to show that true belongs to V of bool, which is immediate from the definition of the value interpretation of bool, right? Okay. So just wanted to unwind the definitions to, to show you how, how that goes. Um, okay. Now, I'm thinking, should we do, would you guys like to do the lambda case? How many people did the, uh, did the proof of strong normalization last night, the lambda case? Didn't get that one. Okay. <laughs> All right. Maybe we should do this then. But you guys, come on. Wake up. Help me out. I don't like this. This, is, this room is way too quiet. Way quieter than last year. <laughs> Benjamin is smiling. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, let's do lambda. <laughs> that might. <laughs> I was somewhere in the middle last year too. <laughs> People are tired, too much cock hacking. Okay, um, here we go. Lambda x colon tau dot e. Uh, maybe we just had a better group last year. We just <laughs> wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch that. We hadn't, what? <laughs> I missed it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so. We're going to prove this theorem here. By the way, let's, uh, let's just step back for a second. Or let me just erase this. Before we wade any further into proofs. Um, this theorem, right, which says that if, if E is well typed, then E semantically behaves like it has type tau. Um, I, I keep using this this terminology semantically behaves like it has type tau because we're doing a proof of type safety, all right? But when you do anything with logical relations, you're going to see a theorem of this form every single time, okay? And the general form is if E is well typed, then it's in the logical relation, 
what, what we've done over here is we've built a logical relation. We first explained when uh, closed values and closed expressions belonged to you know, the value and expression interpretations. And then we explained when open terms were in the logical relation. That's what that notation is, all right, in, in, in if you read it in its most general form. Um, so what, what this is saying, this theorem, is saying that if something is well-typed, then it belongs to the logical relation. This, is, this theorem is known as the fundamental property. It's called the fundamental property of logical relations. It's also called the basic lemma. So in papers that you read, you will see it called either one or the other of these. Um, okay, so whenever you, whenever you do this sort of thing, you set up a logical relation, you always then have to go and prove uh, a fundamental property, which basically tells you something about your logical relation being sort of internally c consistent in some way. Okay, and you'll start to see what I mean by that a little bit more when we get to those binary logical relations. Okay? Uh, all right, so this is the fundamental property that we're proving. Uh, all right, so um, we're proving it by induction on the derivation of that, and we are going to consider the lambda case. All right, so what do we have to show? We have to show that lambda x colon tau 1 dot e semantically behaves like it has type tau 1 or tau 2. Okay, uh, let's look at the definition. All right, we say, suppose we are given a substitution, little gamma, right? So suppose gamma belongs to G gamma. We are required, since we're trying to show this, we're required to show that gamma applied to our expression behaves like it has the appropriate type. So we have to show that gamma of lambda x colon tau 1 dot E belongs to E of our type tau 1, arrow tau 2. Okay? All right. Someone tell me what to do next. Trivial step. So we, can that we can simplify the substitution. Let's push the substitution in. Showing this is equivalent to showing lambda x colon tau 1 dot gamma E belongs to E of tau 1, arrow tau 2. <coughs> okay. Um, all right. So let's go see what we need to do in order to prove this. Let's look at the definition of E tau. Uh, well, we again, we have to say that uh, suppose that our expression steps to some E prime. Right. So suppose that this lambda, I'm really spelling it out, um, steps to some E prime in some number of steps, and E prime is irreducible. And now we have to show that the E prime that we have belongs to V of tau 1, <laughs> arrow tau 2. This is very much like the true case, right? OK, so now we already have a value. So it, that must mean that E prime is, in fact, the lambda term that we had. right? So showing this just amounts to showing that this lambda that we have, lambda x dot gamma e, belongs to v of tau 1 over tau 2. OK? So how do we show that? What do we need to do to show that? Let's look at the definition of v tau 1 over tau 2. Um, what does it say? It says that you get to have a value v in v of tau 1. All right? so. Suppose we are given a value in V of tau 1. Um, we have to show that after beta reduction, when we have gamma E with V for X, right? take the body of this lambda, that's what it says, and substitute V for X. Uh, we have to show that that belongs to E of tau 2. Now what? Hmm, substitution lemma. Um, by the way, we, have we haven't used an induction hypothesis yet, have we? Yeah. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> since I'm pointing at it. Okay. So since we know that um, E is well typed, it has type two, ta uh, type tau two under this environment, under the extended environment. We know by the induction hypothesis that under gamma x colon tau one, semantically, E behaves like it has type tau two. Right? We get that from the induction hypothesis here. And this is a double turnstile. All right. So let's try to use that fact. Yes? A new substitution by extending gamma with for x. Okay, so we have gamma, right? And we know that it's in G of gamma. And this V that belongs to V of tau 1. So gamma extended with x maps to V1, what we want is to show that that satisfies the extended environment, gamma with x colon tau 1. And in order to show that, what do we need to do? Well, we just need to observe that the gamma alone satisfies, belongs to G of gamma, and the V1 alone <coughs> belongs to V of tau 1. We have both of those facts here and here. Right? And that's all we need, looking at the definition of G of gamma. Okay, so we have this fact. So we instantiate this with this gamma. And note that we have, we know that it belongs to G of uh, the extended environment. Um, therefore, we can immediately conclude that if we take this substitution, gamma with x maps to V1, and apply it to this expression, uh, that that belongs to E of this type. How to? Sorry? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. You wanted to that. It's just, you're right. It's the viewer there. Okay? Okay. So we have this fact. Um, and this is what we wanted to show. Which is exactly. Yes, precisely. So th this expression is just equivalent to that. So we could just do gamma E and then substitute V for X. So we're done. Yes? Uh, uh, that induction over the types, right? We're doing, uh, wait, for the... Over the we're doing induction over the type derivation. Okay, so, the, so tau 2 having, okay, so the derivation for uh, okay. Tattoos being smaller type and therefore a subderivation. That's why we get to use that induction hypothesis. I'm just. Um, yes, exactly. So yeah. uh, we have a, a type and derivation that ends with this, right? So the type and derivation that ends with this is a smaller derivation. Yeah. Therefore, ah. we can apply the induction hypothesis to conclude this. They, they don't, no, they don't have to. Well, the blue type's on the capital. But we'll, we're not doing induction on the types right now. The, the bit where induction on types comes in, let's go back and take, stare at this for a second. This logical relation is defined by induction on the structure of types. Okay? Let's look at why this is well-founded. Um, here we define bool. We're defining V of bool. That's pretty easy. That's our base case, right? It doesn't use V of bool or V of anything or E of anything, right? Okay. Um, the definition for at function types is well-founded because it appeals to V of tau 1, but tau 1 is a smaller type than tau 1 hour tau 2, so we're good there. Um, and here it appeals to E of tau 2. Hmm. It doesn't appeal to V of tau 2, so we're not quite sure yet. So let's go look at E of tau 2. Um, if this was E of tau 2, then it means, then that means that it appeals to V of tau 2. But V of tau 2 is smaller than V of tau 1 hour, right? Smaller, tau 2 is smaller than tau 1 hour tau 2. So it's well-founded. Yes? Well, I guess to help me coming up, when we go to recursive types, is it which part of this breaks down? Is it just well-founded as you just described, or is it the induction on the derivation? Uh, it is the definition itself. Okay. It will be in the definition of uh, recursive types. Yes? Uh, there's something stopping us from defining V and E as uh, inductive version of rules. Uh, 
with Ruth, uh, you mean, yeah, sure, that's absolutely my case. That's just a stylistic way of, uh, you know, however you want to write. Well, it's a bit more simple. If you try to define this as an inductive definition with rules in Cork, it will fail because there is a non negative, a non strictly positive occurrence there. Yes, right. Yes. Okay. <coughs> so you really have to define it as uh, by using by social um, recursion over the types in a system like Cork. Yes, and for that I'm going to refer you to, um, there's a chapter on, on uh, normalization for simply hypnotic calculus in, in software foundations. Chapter that and full macro. Okay, and he goes through um, all the details of how you perform like from normalization from yesterday. And the same idea applies to all the logical issues that you have to Okay. Um, We've done the lambda case. This is actually the shorter case. Uh, the application case is a little bit longer. Um, uh, so homework for tonight, <laughs> okay? Uh, try it out at least, just so because you can't really understand logical relations properly unless you at least step through one or two proofs, proofs of at least a couple of cases. Yes. Um, yesterday I was talking specifically in the context of uh, you know. Lambda and application. I, I wouldn't say that, say that um, in general. Yeah. Um, and here, it's not that application is harder. Application is just longer, the proof, because you have two subterms, E1 and E2, and they're both going to need to get reduced to values, and just the way the, the definitions unfold, it becomes a longer proof. All right? Because ultimately, you're trying to show that E1 applied to E2 belongs to the E relation, which says that, you know, the application gets all the way to some value, so you have to look at a bunch of sub-expressions. Apply induction hypothesis twice. Yes? What makes something a It all seems like uh, a more explicit way of doing a big induction loading. That's basically what it is. Okay. Um, so it's just making induction loading explicit. That's a logical relation. Induction loading? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that you make um, the things you are doing here is you are making your induction hypothesis stronger. Yes, exactly. Precisely the point I was sort of emphasizing again and again yesterday. That this is giving you a way to strengthen your induction hypothesis. It's sort of a recipe, if you say. Yes. <coughs> and in, in fact, the recipe to do so in the case of function types will be pretty much exactly the same every single time. Okay? Even when you add other features, you will just be carrying around the other stuff. The lambda case will look very much like If you give me arguments, mm -hmm. this behave like argument type, then after you do beta reduction, that's what you will be able to have the actual result type. Okay. All right. Um, let's talk about... Um, we'll come back to that. Okay. So what I want to do next is talk about recursive types. Um, Actually, before we do recursive types, let's, let's extend this. Um, suppose that we added pairs to our simply typed lambda calculus. Okay? We're going to add pairs. Um, we're going to add expressions of the form first E, second E for projections. Uh, of course, we'll have pairs E1, E2. The value forms will add v1, v2, and all the appropriate typing rules that you expect. All right? And again, small step uh, evaluation semantics. Um, so I want to write down, uh, I want to extend my logical relation with pairs now. So when do values belong to the type tau1 cross tau2? When you have a pair of values, okay. Right. V1 belongs to V tau1. And that's it. V of tau2. It's a pretty simple extension. Nothing else changes. Right? We've sort of mo modularly, we've, we've separated out 
uh, the case for expressions and so on. None of that is affected. So a pair of values belongs to the type behaves like it has type tau 1 cross tau 2 if v1 behaves like it has type tau 1 and v2 behaves like it has type tau 2. How about sums, tagged sums? So let's say we add in left, in right, in left, e, in. Ah, that's the point I was trying to make. Um, so let's ignore sums for a second. We haven't done e of tau 1 cross tau 2. We don't have to, right? Because we generically defined the E relation for any arbitrary type. So we don't need to go and, and extend that in any way. That still holds. Huh? Okay. Um, for the pair extension, not at all. Um, there are certain places where, uh, of course, once we add something like, oh, in fact, when you add recursive types, the E relation will change because the whole model, the whole logical relation changes. It needs to get richer. Another time the whole logical relation changes is when you add mutable references. Okay, the whole logical relation, the structure uh, sort of changes because you need to track more information essentially. Um, yeah, yeah, it has to do exactly, but it has to do with the circularities that crop up, right? Like when you have references, you can do cycles in memory and things are basically no longer well founded. But we'll, we'll get to that. Okay, um, so how about sums? Now we have in left, in right, and case. Okay, uh, value forms in left v, v, in right v. When does a value belong to a sum type? behave like it has a type tau 1 pl uh, plus tau 2? There are two cases. Okay. Why are there two cases? There, there are two different possibilities of what value you can have, right? So a, a value can have this type if it's, let me write it here, if it's in left of V, let's write V1, right? Or if it's in right of v2. Okay, so when does in left of v1 behave like it has type tau 1 plus tau 2? Right, and then we just need to union that with in right v2. So it's quite straightforward. Yes. Um, would it be correct uh, V of T1 by E of T1? Uh, v of T1 with E of T1? Um, so all of these value interpretations of types that we've defined, V of tau is right uh, So in that sense, it's correct. But why would you do that? I think it'll just complicate your life in the proofs or something. All right. Um, okay. Or maybe. Look <laughs> at a little bit, right? Look at this. This is uh, tau cross tau two, which corresponds to conjunction. Uh, here we have tau plus tau two, corresponds to a disjunction or a union. Okay. And what about functions? is essentially an implication, right? That's the style in which I wrote it. I put a dot there, but there's an implication there, right? If, you're give, if you give me a V1 of tau, type tau1, then I get something of type tau2, right? Okay. Um, we're doing a model construction, exactly. We're just interpreting types as sets, okay? Uh, all right, so now let's add recursive types. So how many people here are familiar with recursive types and fold and unfold. Isorecursive from Tapple. <laughs> okay, maybe I should ask how many are not because I just want to know if I should spend five minutes. Okay, I'll spend five minutes. All right, so um, 
Recursive types. All right. So the reason we, we want to add recursive types to our language is because we want to be able to um, encode things like lists and trees. Okay. So something like, um, oh, let's do a tree instead. So you can have a tree type in ML, right? And it could just be um, could be empty, or it could be a leaf, or it could be a node of a tree cross tree cross int. Let's say we're storing integers in the nodes, right? Um, so if we tried to do that in our simply type lambda calculus, what we'd kind of like is to be able to write down uh, definitions like a tree is either nil, um, is, is either a leaf. So let's represent that with the unit type. I'm going to write one for unit types. Everyone okay with unit types? Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, or I'm going to use a, a sum type here. Um, so it's either unit for a leaf or it's a node. So it's a tree cross tree cross int, right? So this type clearly, I mean, we're defining a tree in terms of itself, right? Uh, this, is, this is clearly a, a recursive definition. So if it's a recursive definition, it would be what we basically need to do. Well, okay, let's understand the recursive definition for a second. Uh, let's, let me just write alpha for tree so I don't have to write out tree for every single time. So what that definition is saying, basically, is that tree is equivalent to this definition. Um, so unit plus alpha cross alpha cross int. Product type has priority, so I leave out the braces. Um, so this is equivalent to this, right? And it's equivalent to if I basically take this whole equation and substitute it for alpha on this side, right? So we want, for this alpha, we want to be able to substitute unit plus alpha plus alpha plus int times, again, for this alpha, we can again substitute the whole, we would again substitute the whole thing, so unit plus alpha cross alpha cross int cross int on the outside. So basically, keep substituting for alpha, right? That's what this definition is shorthand for. You, every occurrence of tree here, you basically substitute the whole um, right-hand side for that occurrence of tree again, right? And ultimately, the trees that we're interested in, we could we could take continue this process in the limit, right? And we get an infinite tree, right? Okay. So what we want is we basically want to take uh, this is a recursive definition. We want to take a, a least fixed point. Uh, so so for the tree here, let's try. Uh, everyone okay with fixed points? Sort of. Okay. Um, all right, so let's uh, write down the function f of alpha um, whose fixed point we need in order to get a, get a tree. Um, basically, it should be, well, let's write it like this. Here's a function on types that takes a type alpha, which is my way of saying that alpha is a type, and gives you back the type unit plus alpha cross alpha cross int. Right? And we want to take the least fixed point of that. So in general, um, what we want is, I'm going to write down mu alpha f of alpha for the least fixed point of any function of this form. OK? So if this is the least fixed point of a function that takes a type alpha, then by definition, that means that it is equal to f of mu alpha, f of alpha. That's just by definition of what a fixed point is. Whenever you have a fixed point of a function f, it has to be the case that the fixed point is equal to f of uh, itself. OK? All right. Um, now, let me just write tau here for f of alpha for a second. Mu alpha tau is equal to f of mu alpha 
tau, but f of this, right, f of alpha I'm saying, I'm saying let, let tau be equal to f of alpha, right? So this then is really equal to tau with mu alpha tau substituted for alpha. Yeah? So basically, um, what I'm saying is let's posit the existence of a fixed point, all right, at the type level. Uh, and we're going to write it down as mu alpha tau. And by definition of it being a fixed point, we have this, equa this uh, e equation that mu alpha tau is equal to tau of, um, is equal to tau with mu alpha tau replacing alpha. Okay? All right. Now, um, basically, this is a recursive type. What we want to do is extend, uh, so once we have recursive types of this form, how would we write down tree? We can write it down using this simply as mu alpha unit plus alpha cross alpha cross mu. So having a mu type, a, a recursive type in our language lets us write down, uh, lets us define things like trees and lists and so on. Okay? All right. Um, now, here's the little technical bit. I want, I'm going to add recursive type to our simply type lambda calculus up there. So I'm going to add alpha type variables to my type language, and I'm going to add recursive types mu alpha tau. Okay? And in particular, the, there, are, there are two flavors um, of recursive types that you can add, and, you know, in which you can have recursive types in your language. Um, so one is iso-recursive types. Iso-recursive types is when this equation, let's just ignore this. Let me write it here for clarity. You can view this equation here as an isomorphism or as an equivalence. All right? And that essentially leads to two forms of um, recursive types that you can add to your language. So if you view it as an isomorphism, then that means that you want, that you need some sort of operation in your language to witness that the view is changing. So you have something of this type, and you wish to treat it as something of this type. You need to do something in order to shift the view. And we call that, an, we can call it an unfold operation or an unroll operation. It just unfolds the type in a sense for you. All right, um, and we have a fold operation that goes in the opposite direction. So fold and unfold witness this isomorphism. They allow you to shift views between these two types. Um, there's another way of doing recursive types, which is where you don't treat this equation as um, an isomorphism, rather you, uh, you treat it as an equivalence. There, that's called equi-recursive types. Okay, so iso-recursive types and equi-recursive types. Um, we're not gonna do equi-recursive types. In equi-recursive types, you don't need the operation um, you treat it as an equivalence, and the type system basically has to do inference of, uh, about when you're shifting views. But I won't go there. Okay, so what we're going to do is, is add some operations. We're going to add fold E and unfold E to our language. And I'm going to erase the evaluation context we have here just so I have more room. Um, okay, so value forms, we are going to add fold V as a value form here. And this will come clear in a second. Um, and so, so notice here, yeah, I should make this point before I move on. Fold is an operation that given an expression of type, of the expanded type, tau with mu alpha tau for alpha, gives you back an expression of the type mu alpha tau. And unfold goes in the opposite direction. Okay? So fold expressions will have type Alpha, mu alpha tau, and unfold expressions will have the type tau with mu alpha tau for alpha, the expanded type. Okay? Uh, all right. In terms of evaluation context, we have the stuff before, and now we want to evaluate under the fold or the unfold till we get a value. So we have fold E, unfold E. Okay, and in terms of reduction rules, we add the following. When you unfold, so you get this down to a value, right? Sorry, unfold, you get this down to a value. What, what value can be sitting on? Oh, oh, I should show you the typing rule first. Let's go look at the typing rule first. All right, um, so under gamma, fold E has type mu alpha tau. 
if E has type, how would mu alpha tau for alpha? That's the point I was trying to make over there. Um, and unfold is the converse. Unfold E has type tau with mu alpha tau for alpha if E has type mu alpha tau. So this expands the type and this sort of contracts the type, rolls it back. Okay. Um, so in terms of the operational semantics, the, the only reduction rule we need to add over here is when we have an unfold of a fold V. And that simply steps to V. value forms that we've added? Fold V. So fold V has type mu alpha tau. That's um, the form of value that we have, that we have for recursive types. So let's uh, define V of mu alpha tau. What values belong to V of mu alpha tau. values can we put here? Do we want to put here? Six point? Let's, um, what value did I just add? <laughs> right? We've been picking values out of this grammar right here. So fold V. Okay. When, is a fold, when does a fold V behave like it has type? It has this recursive type mu alpha tau. Let's go look at the typing rules for a hint. If we had a fold V, the underlying V should behave like it has type tau with mu alpha tau for alpha. Yeah? So why don't we just say that? That's basically what we want. We want to say that V behaves like something of type tau with mu alpha tau for alpha. Okay, what's wrong with that? It's ill-founded, right? We are trying to define the interpretation of this type, but inside the definition, we are using uh, the definition for a larger type. Okay, so this is clearly not well-founded. All right, what can we do? Okay, but I'm not going to do six points. Okay, um, we're going to do this using the technique of step-index logical relations. All right? So far, and you know, until two, 2000, I think, yes, um, until 2000, so 12 years ago, um, logical relations were always defined by induction on the structure of types. And then extending them to uh, settings where you had even recursive functions and recursive types and um, let alone mutable references, all of these more advanced features where you have certain kinds of circularities creep in and types start to get bigger. Um, it was really hard to extend logical relations to those settings. And, and people 
did come up with logical relations that did that, but uh, they were essentially denotational in flavor and they used rather complicated math, functors, et cetera, um, in order to do it, okay? Um, Step-index logical relations take, uh, are sort of, okay, first of all, step-index logical relations fall into this category of the operational kind of logical relations. So I just mentioned denotational logical relations where you essentially interpret types using some sort of mathematical object. You say V of tau is inhabited by some sort of mathematical function, et cetera. Okay, we're not doing denotational version of logical relations. We're not doing denotational semantics. We're using a very operational flavor of logical relations. That's why, you know, you see, when does an expression E belong to E of tau? Oh, let's go run it. <laughs> okay, that's gonna happen over and over again. Uh, we, we sort of run things to see if they behave like the thing that we expect. Okay, all right. Um, so, now, step index logical relations. Um, basically, here the problem is that the types are getting larger. With step indexing, we're going to add, we're gonna extend our logical relation slightly. We are going to say, we're not just gonna say that some value v belongs to the value interpretation of tau. We're going to say that value v, we're gonna put a, a natural number here, zero or greater. This is our step index. And here's how you want to read this. Some value v looks like it has type tau for up to k steps. So if I give you um, a v that belongs to tau uh, for k steps, you can go do anything with that value that you like, but you only have k steps within which nothing will go wrong. If you run more than k steps, if you try to do something with this value uh, beyond k steps, then it, it may actually get stuck or not behave like what you expect. Okay? So I'm sort of approximating what I know. Yes? for k steps. Let's go edit our definition. When does a value behave like a boolean for k steps? Or what are the values that behave like booleans for k steps? This is true and false, right? We don't need to do, do anything else, right? Okay, now let's put a k here. I'm giving you, sorry? Ah, okay. Um, that's what Benjamin is pointing out. Uh, and I was trying to, to avoid that for two more minutes. <laughs> I will come back to that in a second. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so basically what I've just done is, I, I haven't put any arbitrary values here, right? I've put values that type check, right? I said this in the beginning that I'm, I'm always gonna put build these value interpretations out of values that syntactically have the right type. Okay? So that's why I only have true and false here. What Benjamin was asking is why can't I put an arbitrary value, say that an arbitrary value is in there um, for zero steps? 
I'm just not going to do that. I'll, I'll take care of that in a different way. So just hold that thought for a second. All right. So let's talk about when functions behave like they have type tau on our tau 2 for k steps. Okay. So you have a lambda term. You have, I, I give you a lambda term. All right. What can you do with it? You have k steps to run. What can you do with it? to test if it's not a lambda. That's, that's what you're doing here. Think of yourself as the adversary. I'm going to give you something and say you have k steps, and you're going to try to, you know, run, do things with it to figure out, to make it, you know, behave in certain ways and, and test if, if that assumption goes wrong. Okay? All right. So, have a lambda term. You have k steps. What can you do with it? Apply it. Okay, but you could either apply it now or at some point in the future. Right? So in particular, you might be in the middle of a big program expression where you have a lambda being applied to some argument and maybe your program needs to take some, uh, you need to take some, uh, some st steps to evaluate the argument down to a value. All right, so you can, if, if I give you a lambda, you can apply it either now or in the future. Okay, I'm going to capture that by saying lambda x dot e belong, behaves like it has type tau and r tau 2 for k steps if at some point in the future, when we have j possibly less than k steps left, if at that point you give me uh, an argument that is good for the remaining number of steps, which is j, then after beta reduction, e with v for x should be good for j steps as well. Okay? All right. Now, when does an expression behave like it has some type tau for up to j steps. All right, so I'm going to put a k here. So an expression E behaves like it has type tau for k steps if what? Well, um, so k is the max you have. All right, so we're going to say, um, basically you're going to take E and you're going to run it for a while till it gets to a value. All right, so for some, suppose that, um, for some j strictly less than k, suppose that E reduces to E prime in j steps. Okay, so I started out, I, I, I'm trying to figure out if this expression behaves like this type for k steps. I started out with k, I used up j of those steps to get to this irreducible point. Now how many steps do I have left? k minus j. So my E prime should behave like a value of type tau for k minus j. Okay? All right. Now, coming back to the point um, of what happens when you have zero steps left. When I have zero steps left, uh, does Is this true? Ah, sorry. Does true behave like a function of type bool arrow bool for zero steps? Yes, it does. Okay, so in particular, uh, then something like lambda x bool dot true looks like it has type bool arrow bool arrow bool. for one step, right? Because if I give you a lambda, this, this guy looks like it, it's a function for zero steps. Okay, now let's make that the body of this lambda. Now uh, you have a lambda, what can you do with it? You can apply it to something, right? In fact, I could, uh, let me put a v here. I don't even need to put a v here. This lambda belongs to the value interpretation of this function type for one step. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because you only have one step. So you can apply this to some Boolean value, and then you need to show that the body has, uh, behaves like an expression of type bool arrow bool for the remaining number of steps, which at that point will be zero. Okay? Oh, okay. Ask more. Okay. Um, Uh, 
Ah, okay, good point. Um, all right, so let's, uh, so okay, we're defining this, re this logical relation now by induction, by primary induction on these number of steps and secondary induction on the types. Okay, so that's what we're doing. Keeping that in mind, let's look at what's going on at the well-foundedness of this bit of the definition. Um, so we're trying to define uh, the interpretation of tau 1 r tau 2 at k steps. And in the definition, we are using k, which, I mean j, which could be k, because I put a less than or equal to here, right? Um, but this is, but, so my point is that the step index might not get smaller, but the type gets smaller, so we're still okay. Alternatively, you could perfectly well write this definition with a j strictly less than k over there. Because if it's a lambda, you will always take one step before uh, you need to, you know, show anything. So that will work out fine as well. Okay, so here's, here's one idea. I should draw this timeline. We're over here. We have k steps left. And we have a lambda. I'll just write lambda x naught. At some point in the future, when we have j steps left, someone, actually let's say when we have j plus 1 steps left, someone gives us a value. And now we're going to take our lambda x naught e and apply it to that value. This beta reduction step is going to eat up exactly one step. And now you will have j steps left. Okay? So at this point, this expression will have stepped to e with v for x. That's what we have when we have j steps left. So now we just need to show that the e with v for x is good for the remaining j steps. Um, with j equals 1? Yeah. itself as a function though. Yeah. Yes, this is analogous to what we were talking about yesterday with strong normalization. Why do we need to show that lambda, um, you know, like why do we need to worry about uh, lambda belonging to the set <coughs> uh, Well, because at some point you can apply that lambda and then the body sitting inside the lambda is the thing that you will be able to run. That's the intuition. That's what this remaining J steps is for. So this function, this function, could be taking as its argument another function, for instance, 
and you could, um, yeah, this could be another function. And then inside here, you could apply that function. So you need to have some sort of, you know, you, you need to control how many steps you have allotted for that to run. we added step indexing at all, right? Because this definition was not well founded. All right, so now let's try to figure out. Fold V belongs to this type for K steps if, if what? Right, we want to reduce the step here. So I'll just say for all J strictly less than K, V belongs to the bigger type for J steps. You could even put k minus 1. Yeah, absolutely. So you could put j strictly less than k, or you could just put k minus 1. If you put k minus 1, you have to be a little bit careful in a proof later on. But that's all. <laughs> that's precisely where. Yeah. OK, so um, sorry, what's your name? Gabriel. Gabriel. OK, so what Gabriel just mentioned is that we want a form of monotonicity, right? We, we, I keep saying that v looks like 
it has type tau for up to k steps. So if I give you a value that looks like it has type tau for five steps, should it have be look like it has type tau for four steps? Yes, because I said up to, right? And that intuition is captured by a lemma called, uh, you know, the types, type interpretations are downward closed or it's a monotonicity property. Anytime we have um, V belongs to V tau for K steps, we have to be able to prove that V belongs to, um, to type tau for J steps for any J less than or equal to K. Okay? Call it uh, types are downward closed or monotonicity. We're going to have to prove this summer. All right, I should let everyone go for lunch at this point. We'll continue with this tomorrow. All right?